Hey Big Geeks and welcome to an episode in which we ask, um, what even is life? No, Baltic Porter. <laughs> We get a lot of questions about Baltic Porter. Mm. I thought it would be too niche and we wouldn't, but actually in the comments and on the discords and, and in the emails, we get we get a fair amount of questions about what the difference between an Imperial Stout and a Baltic Porter is. And the answer is obviously complicated. <laughs> so the too long didn't read answer is basically this. It's a slightly lower alcohol mm. Imperial Stout, mm. but... It's a lager. What? <laughs> so it uses lager yeast yeah. and lager ring, the process, the process lager cold, ring. long storage of the beer to settle out to create what should be a lighter, brighter, uh, crisper, very strong dark beer. Wow. So it's a, re it's a real mishmash, isn't it? It's a real mishmash, and we'll get into how that came about while we have uh, some very strong dark beer. What could go wrong? <laughs> so all three of these beers are non-traditional Baltic porters. Yeah. Finding a classic Baltic porter was pretty tricky. I think we'd go with the one where the processes are at least closest yeah. to where it should I be. I mean, that one is from the Baltic region. <laughs> that is, but then this is a collaboration with that brewery, Pachala. Ah. Oh my God, it's like oil. That so. <laughs> So this is from Verdant. We haven't had Verdant on the channel for a little while, so I'm excited to have them back. They're one of the best IPA brewers in the world. Without a doubt. But they also make magic dark beer as well. So if you ever see a Verdant dark beer, pick it up. So let's talk about this beer. Let's get some flavours and then we'll dive into the history. Green coffee beans. I know we're all sniffing them at home. Green coffee beans? So yeah, like unroasted. Unroasted, so like virgin coffee beans. Yeah. I don't think I've ever sniffed green coffee beans before. Where are you getting these from, Johnny? I'm just making it up. I don't have these things in my life. <laughs> I don't know what that smells like. So it's just like, or like really, really lightly roasted coffee. Yeah. So slightly green, red fruitiness, ever so slight milk chocolate. But oh, yeah, I'm getting chocolate. chocolate. Getting chocolate hits. And I'm definitely getting green, green coffee beans as well. There you go, yeah, of course now you I, are. Now I know what they are. But it's surprisingly crisp. Guess the ABV from the aroma. I mean, it doesn't seem that crazy. Yeah. But I guess it's going to be high. But, like, I mean, that is, like, a 4 or 5% portion, Yeah, it right? smells, doesn't smell insanely. Yeah, it's 10.2. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, cheers. Oh, wow. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, this is this is doing the opposite of a lot of beers where it's huge on the nose. And yeah. Then you're a bit like, meh. This is, like, quite, like, meh, on the nose. But then when you dive in, oh, yeah. my God. God. It's like like beer often suffers from what I call the, the the coffee complex, which is it smells amazing and then the flavors don't come through. This is the opposite. Like like we said, green uh, green coffee beans, milk chocolate. Oh my god, heavily roasted coffee, really dark chocolate, dark brambly fruits. It burns Johnny <laughs> in a warming way. In a good, in a good yeah. warming way, yeah. Yeah. It's syrupy, isn't it? It's very, very um, unctuous. But it's also, I mean, it is pretty dry on the finish. So it's mm. syrupy to start, dry on the finish, clean on the finish. And that is what's beautiful about a Baltic porter. So you have all that richness, all that unctuous, all that heady aroma that pops in your brain, particularly once you've, you've drunk it. But it's got a really crazy clean finish. Yeah, I mean, that is what has in common with lava. It's not hanging around no. for days. It's like... Whoa! And then, oh. So it's kind of a crushable imperial style, right? Crushable imperial style, I like yeah. it. I yeah. I think we should recategorize it as a crushable imperial <laughs> style. A, a crushable imperial style at a mere 10%. A mere 10.2. Because te oh, okay. the point 0.2 will get you. It's not the 10, it's the point 0.2. <laughs> so, I mean, the history of how we get to this point is, is kind of amazing. Go on. So... The best way to talk about it is in terms of Imperial Stout. So Imperial Stout, we've done a whole video on it, which you can watch in one of these corners. Basically, it was sent over to Russia, to St. Petersburg, to the, the Russian court and to the aristocracy in Russia throughout the, the, the 18th and 19th century. They loved it. Now, obviously, to get to there, you had to go past and through lots of countries. You had to go through the Danish uh, the, like the sound, the Danish sound, the gap between Denmark and... Yeah. Um, Scandinavia to get through. 
Um, and obviously they'd be stopping off, they'd be selling beer, they'd Are you be saying trading. that some beers might have fallen off the uh, wagon on the uh, No, I, I think they were legitimately Oh, sold. legitimate. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, now, the strongest stuff was held for the Russian court. That's where they get the most money. But Porter was, was sold throughout the Baltic region for a long time, for hundreds of years. The UK had the best reputation for it. Everybody wanted it. And it was incredibly expensive in, in Poland, in Denmark. Once we hit sort of the 18th century in particular, there, there's some interruptions to supply. Wars. Napoleon decides that no British ship should go through past Denmark. And also, there was a kind of, there was a like, I mean, we could brew this cheaper and make the money ourselves. So breweries, in particular, there was one particular brewer who went over to the UK and spent years there learning how to make porter and then went back. And started brewing port. A spy. There. Yeah, a spy, a Polish spy. <laughs> we we saw particularly at the start of the nineteenth century, people starting to brew their own in Poland and in Estonia and in Denmark, trying to recreate the, the classic it's, British port. Tale as old as time, isn't it? You see something you like, you want to emulate yeah. it. Like New England IPA in the UK. <laughs> I can do that, and I can make it, and I can make the money out of it. Yeah, here. So exactly. I'm going to do it. Exactly that. This makes sense. What we've got is we've got some pretty cold nations generally. And we've also got the proliferation towards the end of the 19th century mm. of lager, of pale lager, starting to get very popular on mainland Europe and starting to spread. What happened was because it was colder out there, it was easier to make cold fermented beer. Because of the proliferation of lager beer, people started making bottom fermented versions of porters. So they started using lager yeast with the classic British porter recipe. And that, again, I like, is it's like a sort of dissemination of culture and how it spreads around the world and it gets adapted to the unique microclimate or whatever area it finds itself in. They like the, the dark beers that we were brewing. They tried to emulate in their own way, but they had more favourable conditions for, for brewing lagers. And that's where we get this unique mix of really clean, snappy finishes with big brown and black malt dark roasty styles it's quite bonkers really isn't it because like whenever you think of lagering you only ever think of lager like of like pale lager pale lager yeah. so like there aren't it's not like there are loads of different beer styles that use a lagering process no no absolutely i mean there are sort of particularly in in bohemia so in in munich and in czech republic you have the dark lagers yeah. um you have the schwartz beers you have the i mean actually there is um i think towards the end of the 19th century it was Somebody made a comparison, a beer historian made a comparison between Salvatore, which was Paulana's mm. dark Bock beer, 8%, hoppy as hell, dark lager, with the Baltic porters of Poland. We recently did a live show with Pahala, and they talked a lot about their Baltic porters. They make lots of them. They make them fantastically. They generally add adjuncts to them and stuff like that, as we're about to find out. But what we learned from them is that while Baltic porter is essentially a bottom-fermented, lagered, strong dark beer, Mm -hmm. stay with me um, there was variation within all the Baltic states so while from like a BJCP kind of um, approach that's the definition mm -hmm. there's lots of kind of Kolsch style okay. Baltic porters so they use a top fermenting yeast an ale yeast but they lager it afterwards much like is done in, in Cologne with those lagers so they're adding some fruitiness but they're also trying to get a bit of a clean snap and not adding too much of that kind of more ailey, um, fruity character. So there's a bit of blurring around what a Baltic porter really is. Indeed. Um, and on that note... Cheesecake time. Right, so this is from Pahala. Apparently we still don't pronounce it right, I apologise. Um, and th this has vanilla, lemon and lactose in. But let's see if we can still pick out what makes it um, a, a Baltic porter, not... An imperial porter or an imperial stout. Right. Uh, <laughs> I think on the nose that's going to be hard to tell. Yeah. Because it smells like cheesecake. They've gone big on the lemon and I think that's better. There's that, that, yeah, that lemon zingy sort of freshness yep. that you get on the cheesecake. Absolutely. And it just cuts through the, the roastiness better than mm. just a bit of lactose wood. Although there's lactose in it, but it's subtle. Wow. Oh, it's such a big beer. <laughs> oh, my days. My palate has just gone. I mean, it's wonderful because it it's got it's got burnt ah. burnt toast characteristics, soft coffee characteristics, an absolute metric ton of sour lemon. Yeah, 
and then loads of lactose to stop it being a sour. Yeah, it's got that sort of sweetness that you get in the lactose. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a bonkers full-on beer. It, it's one of my favourite sort of pastry-style beers I've had in years. I think it's beautifully balanced, huge, mm. but it's definitely quite clean. I'm just left with burnt toast. Yeah, I get a little bit of the zinginess left, but predominantly it does disappear, doesn't it? Almost instantly it's like... Whoosh, gone. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. We talk about lager and we talk about, you know, a lot of time we talk about the lagering process and talk about kind of what it adds to beer. Mm. But really, it just takes away stuff. Yeah. You know, everything's happening slowly. It's eating up all of the, the additional flavours. And what it means is you're left. You can just taste the stuff that's left. It's a minim it's, it's almost like a minimalist. If it was a person, then they'd be a minimalist. And they're, you can't hide behind anything. And to have that on a pastry, I think more pastry stouts should be made with lager yeast because I think it takes away a little bit of that kind of residual, almost tannic, but it's mostly sweetness thing that's left on your tongue. Whereas this, combined with the, the roasted malt, um, just makes for a really pleasant drinking experience. It's almost more drinkable than the non-pastry. Yeah, I mean, it's which is strange, isn't it? Because like, you think a pastry stout, stout would almost be... Pastry what? Sickly sweet. And yeah. like a bit clawing and like, hang around too long and make you feel a little bit icky after you've drunk it. It can do. It's, it's a very much a bottle share beer. Yeah. We have a little bit. This, yeah, I'd finish that bottle. You could, you could finish it and you would be like, I'm good. I'm good to go. In your brain you'd be like, what? I'm fine. Yeah. But everyone else is like, oh. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so I definitely regret bringing three beers to this party, but should we, <laughs> should we do the third one? It's a big, it's a big boy party, isn't it? It, it, it is. It is. It's the... It's an early start and an early bail, oh. uh, which I was, I was the king of at university, if I'm honest. Um, so this is from Burnt Mill, who are a brewery who make incredible hoppy beer. But I, you know, the head brewer used to work for Muntons, the Maltery, the Maltery, the Maltings. Maltings. And so I, I have full faith in a, a really malty beer. They're going to come through. And I wanted to give this a go as well because they've added cacao nibs oh, and wow. cacao husks. Oh, husks as well. So I'm hoping for a husky, hay kind of vibe to this as well that'd be nice and dry yeah now that oh my god wait 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 that smells like a german dark lager it's definitely lagery it's husk it's husky there's a tiny hint of sulfur like the tiniest amount which i love it's a proper lager-esque kind of vibe i mean if i close my eyes and pretend i didn't see what went in the glass could be a dark lager. Okay, you think it was a Schwartz beer? I, I, I would, if I was in a beer judging and you handed me that, I'd smell that and go, oh, it's a Schwartz beer. Amazing. Let's give this a go. Let's see if it's as fresh and, and light as it smells. Mm. That is class. Yeah, that's real nice. 9% Bradley. I mean, it's gone. It, it's, uh, there's nothing hanging around. Great. The, the, um, the cacao really adds a dry... Uh, chocolate note to it, which you'd expect, but the use of husk, I think, really helps it feel lagery yeah. and dry and, and hay-like. Um, much like like a, a Carafa, Carafa 3 kind of wood. Um, although that's de-husk, but it just adds that dryness without roastiness. Mm. Um, oh my God, it's Fantastic. just incredibly drinkable. Compared to either of these two, you know, in my head... That's what a Baltic Porter would be. These guys have had fun with it. This one is like, it's, it's like a 9% dark lager. It's just unbelievable. So is that, do you think that is the thing with a Baltic Porter? It should be almost infinitely drinkable, like a lager. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think it would have been designed back then to be ultimately drinkable. But I think the reason that it would have proved so popular in other nations other than Poland, where it was kind of created, was because it was incredibly sippable yeah. and drinkable and um, would have been therefore like better throughout all the seasons um you'd have been able to brew it and then lie it down and wait you know you probably didn't brew over the summer mm. so it would have lasted really well for the six months while summer was happening or whatever it is like just a really um utilitarian beer like you could drink it all year round it could warm you or it could refresh you and still be complex and enjoyable so I am so on board with the idea of Baltic Porters. I think it's a brilliant representation of really dark beer and you can actually do lots more to experiment with it than maybe you even can with an Imperial Stout. I think it gives you a little bit more room to play with 
and something on the finish where instead of just being left with sweetness, you're left with you know the pastry that you might have added. Um, so I think it's it's a beautiful style. Uh, it's a varied style and it's a confusing style. But uh, we didn't get into craft beer for clarity. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's certainly not any uh, any of that in here. No, absolutely. So um, here's the murky deliciousness. Cheers. Thanks for watching right to the end of this video, folks. If you want to know what video we filmed after three 10% beers, <laughs> it was the British Spontaneous beer. So watch out for that one probably a week before this one. <laughs>